Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to UNH um, Space Science Seminar. And we have um, Dr. Chris Klein giving his seminar today. Um, Chris got his um, PhD at the University of Iowa. And he did several postdocs at the University of Michigan, um, Iowa, and um, here at the University of New Hampshire. And I have the pleasure of working with Chris on Helioswarm. Okay, Chris, now um, I'll let you introduce Helioswarm. Thank you very much, uh, both for that introduction and for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about a NASA uh, a mission concept that's been selected for phase A study for the MIDEX uh, uh, announcement of opportunity uh, called Helioswarm, in which we are trying to understand fundamental questions about turbulence in, uh, in, in space and frankly, astrophysical plasmas. Now this work uh, is obviously more than the work of just a single individual. Uh, there's a whole broad team of scientists, engineers, uh, project managers that have been involved uh, from the science team. Uh, uh, this is, is being led by Harlan Spence, who you're all quite familiar with, uh, but has uh, a broad, uh, group of both domestic and international scientists that are contributing, ranging all the way from Alexandrova and Arismovsky to Zank and Zweibel. So really covering the range from A to Z. Uh, we also wanna thank the really tremendous work of our, our colleagues at uh, NASA's Ames Research Center, people actually providing or proposing to provide the spacecraft from both Northrop Grumman Blue Canyon, and then the people building the actual instruments that will enable us to advance the science at the Smithsonian and across the pond, both in France and in the United Kingdom. So these are the people with whom we are working to, to make, uh, to advance our understanding of turbulence. And so let's move on to the actual roadmap uh, of where we'll be going over this next uh, 50 minutes or so. So we're going to start off making sure we're all on the same page with an understanding of what is turbulence and so what? Why do we actually care? At which point in time we can then move into uh, looking at uh, what are the outstanding science questions and specifically the questions that Helioswarm is going to try to bring closure to. We'll then move to a discussion of how in the world will we, will we actually make those, those advancements? Uh, how are we going to take these open questions and with a, uh, an observatory that's comprised of not one, not a few, but an entire set of eight nodes in a single hub, uh, better understand these, these systems. And then we'll, uh, time permitting, actually talk about some of the detailed uh, implementation that, that uh, the, the team has been working hard on to actually move from a concept uh, to a launched mission. So without further ado, let's talk about what is turbulence. Uh, I know it's a very abstract concept. Sometimes people's uh, eyes roll back or glaze over when they hear turbulence. But if you walk away from at least this introduction with one fundamental concept, it's that turbulence is multi-scale disorder. A turbulent flow is one where you have a gas, a plasma, some sort of system that has uh, it, uh, fluctuations that are chaotic, irregular, random, that don't have a single characteristic, either time or frequency scale. This large, broadband set of different fluct uh, fluctuations uh, interact one with another in a nonlinear fashion, which leads to a transport of mass momentum and energy from very large scales to smaller and smaller scales until eventually that energy can act to dissipate and actually lead to a thermodynamic change in the system, actually heating the system. Um, anytime you read a turbulence paper, there's a better than one in two shot that the first sentence will have the word ubiquitous in it. Uh, we'd like to say that turbulence is ubiquitous throughout the universe. You see this, uh, this, uh, this phenomenon arising, whether it's in fluids, uh, 
captured here by the roll up of a wave and then these smaller uh, structures that arise from it in a, in a woodcut or in a variety of different kinds of simulations of say uh, space plasmas. For instance, this MHD simulation, I think run on UNH's trillion servers um, of the interaction between the solar wind and the Earth's magnetosphere, where we have these really large scale Kelvin Helmholtz like roll up structures that then break apart uh, and transfer their energy to smaller and smaller scales. Um, in terms of this being a, a outstanding set of questions and an unsolved set of questions, there's the, the, the anecdote that when um, Heisenberg goes to meet the Supreme Being, uh, he has two questions on his lips. The first is why quantum mechanics? And the second is, uh, is why turbulence? So, so understanding this nonlinear transport of energy, how, how best to describe it, how best to model it, is an outstanding an unsolved mystery of classical physics. Now, to have kind of established that simple cartoon picture, uh, we can think of a very simple forward cascade of energy. If you have your coffee cup in the morning, you add some tracer particles into it in the form of, say, cream, uh, and want to stir that cream in. You take your spoon, you stir the largest scale in the system, and that creates very large eddy structures. Those will then start to shear one another, nonlinearly interacting, and cascading energy from the largest scale to a slightly smaller scale. Those eddies then interact and continue that cascade to smaller and smaller scales until eventually that cascade is terminated when some mechanism or mechanisms act to, uh, to remove the energy, to dissipate the energy from the cascade more quickly than they can be nonlinearly transferred to even smaller scale structures. Uh, and it's something like a fluid, viscosity plays the role of, of uh, the dissipating mechanism. And something like a plasma, things are more complicated. There's a variety of different proposed mechanisms for what acts to actually terminate that cascade. And understanding what's happening with that red arrow there is one of the things that we're going to be focusing on with Helios 1. Now, turbulence itself is, is fascinating, but it's also very important for setting the background for a number of other fundamental processes. That is, if you want to understand shocks, if you want to understand reconnection, those processes are happening at the same time that you have turbulence. You really can't separate one from the other if you want to have a holistic uh, understanding of how energy mass momentum is being transported through the system. So we need to have an understanding of basic turbulent phenomenology if we want to have an accurate description of, say, magnetic reconnection. Now, we can do slightly more detailed studies, more detailed models uh, than simply coffee being stirred around in, in a mug. Uh, and so we, we can look at uh, basically the amount of power that's contained at a, a certain uh, a scale. So something like the trace power spectral density, which is what's shown here in this uh, bottom left hand plot. Uh, uh, th these are the sorts of, of uh, spectral uh, power plots that you'll see in, in every turbulent, um, in most turbulent presentations. Uh, and these have clearly defined physical regimes in them. They have at the very largest scale. So the x-axis here is the frequency. We'll talk about how one can move between frequency and spatial structure a few slides down. But at the very lowest frequency, which uh, are equivalent to the very largest scales, you have your, your injection of energy, your stirring of energy, which then breaks over and transitions into an inertial range, which is where you have that self-consistent uh, transfer of energy from scale to scale. And depending on the nature of the nonlinear mechanism that leads to the cascade, you can come up with a particular uh, spectral exponent that you'd expect to see in this range. If you've done a few back the envelope calculations and in, in whatever classes you've taken on turbulence, 
the word Kamal Gras probably rings a bell, as does the index five thirds. In a, in a simple fluid picture, you can make an argument based on a few simplifying assumptions that within the inertial range, the, the spectral index should be something like minus five thirds. That story gets more complicated in the case of a plasma, where you have magnetic fields and flows interacting and, and the model becomes more complicated, but understanding what these spectral index, indices are, are one way of accessing the, the nature of that tr uh, turbulent transport of energy from scale to scale. Eventually, again, you have that, that transition from the cascade to some form of dissipation, where in a fluid, viscosity acts to remove energy from the system. In a collisionless plasma, you need to have some other mechanism that acts to arrest the cascade. Uh, we see that arises near ion kinetic scales, whether rho or d depends on what mechanism you think is actually acting to remove energy from the system. And that removal of energy energy from the cascade uh, is, is, uh, is seen as this further steepening uh, of the spectral index, uh, going from 5 thirds to 2.8. I will attempt to look at the chat. Great. Um, uh, so, uh, so that's one way that we can, we can study, we can model these systems, but it is by no mean, it means a complete description uh, of the, these nonlinear couplings. Uh, you can look at higher order statistics. This is effectively a, a second order spectrum. You're looking at the, the power, the energy as a function of scale. But if you look at higher order quantities, you'll see that you don't expect to see a clear homogeneous distribution of, of energy, but rather those nonlinear couplings lead to current sheets and other uh, enhancements in structure. Uh, this is a two-dimensional cut taken from a turbulent simulation uh, in which I believe they're plotting the current. It could also be the magnetic amplitude. Uh, the intensity of the color corresponds to the intensity of the fluctuation at that point in space. And you see that there are some regions where you have really large scale amplitudes and then other regions where they're relatively, uh, relatively weaker. And so we see these kinds of current sheets and intermittent structures arise due to the nature of the nonlinear interactions. And so the models that we build to describe this transport of energy necessarily need to describe that kind of a nonlinear coupling. And so different models will prescribe different uh, statistics for how frequently and how intense these current sheet-like structures should actually arise. Um, again, this is something that's important, not just for uh, understanding in and of itself, not just for understanding space problems, but for looking at systems that are astrophysical in nature. Here's a list, I think, of, of nine different uh, astrophysical systems all which have invoked at some point over the last two or three decades, turbulence as a fundamental process that either enables or disables different kinds of, of, uh, of uh, thermodynamic transport. For instance, if you want to uh, limit your thermal conduct, uh, conduction in galaxy clusters, you need to have a sufficiently turbulent uh, uh, set of fluctuations. Uh, if you want to have a certain kind of star formation occurring, you uh, the theorists will frequently also invoke turbulence. And so here is just a, uh, a sampling of these different kinds of environments where uh, people have attempted to model a process and says, well, in order to actually get the kind of heating that we see, to get the kind of, of, of rates of star formation, we need to have turbulence involved. The difficulty with all but maybe the last two of these systems is that they are remarkably far away, which means at best we can either attempt to simulate them numerically or gather photons in from them. However, the sun, the solar wind, provides an excellent uh, laboratory for actively testing many of these processes. We can get local measurements of not just a few photons from very far away, but of the actual charged particles and the electromagnetic fields and get them simultaneously. Uh, and in doing so, get a better insight into these, these, this turbulence, uh, this turbulence. Um, 
And so that brings us to a set of open questions that Helioswarm is going to uh, be trying to address. Just checking my time to make sure I'm going either too fast or slow. So um, the, the four that I've highlighted here are expounded upon in much greater detail uh, in these two white papers uh, put together by Jason Tenbarge and Bill Matthews. Uh, they're both posted on archive if, if you're interested. Um, but, but effectively, the things that Helios Warmer is going to be focusing on is try to come up with better constraints for the rate at which but also the, the, na the fundamental nature of that cascade of energy. Because we have a, a background magnetic field, because there is a, uh, a fundamental direction of, of the flow of the plasma, those things can modify a simple isotropic fluid transport of, of, of energy from scale to scale. And so depending on the, um, the nature of the nonlinear interactions, we could get fundamentally different uh, turbulent cascade rates. We've attempted to measure those in the past using uh, a number of very sophisticated models combined with very sophisticated analyses of single spacecraft measurements, but those are limited in the fact that you're only measuring at one point in space as the solar wind is moving past you. With Helioswarm, we're going to have the ability to measure at multiple points and multiple scales, which, should, which will enable us to better constrain not only the rate at which energy is transported, but the, the anisotropies of that cascade rate as well, which will naturally help us better understand how energy is distributed in these turbulent systems, both in terms of those kinds of intermittencies, but also as a function of scale. A number of different models have been proposed for exact, exactly how energy should be distributed as a function of space and time. Is it the magnetic field leading to the formation of something like critical balance? Are we expecting to see something like slab plus 2D, which are all different models that you'll hear theorists argue about um, that describe exactly how wave vector anisotropic the energy is distributed. And by having a multi-point, multi-scale measurement of the turbulence, we will be able to bring closure to a lot of these open questions. We also want to be able to better study the, the questions about intermittency, just how intense and how frequent are those current sheets that, that arise. One of the things that we, in theory, could do is just run big numerical simulations of these systems. But the difficulty with turbulence, because it is fundamentally a multi-scale process, is that you need really, really big uh, numerical boxes in order to get the the realistic scale separations that you see in, in a system like the solar wind. But if you have a box that, that, that is that large, you have to neglect other physical processes. So here uh, we have, I believe, two-dimensional and three-dimensional simulations using either MHD or a particle in cell code, uh, a kinetic code that includes all of the, uh, the correct underlying uh, physics. The difficulty is that if you include the kinetic physics, you're constrained to a small box. If you don't include the kinetic physics, you can have a much larger box, but you don't have all of the correct dissipation mechanisms. And so you see in all of these different numerical realizations, you have very different intermittency characteristics. So we, we, we are pushing the boundaries of what we can do with numerical studies. And so instead of attempting to extract uh, insights about intermittency from these uh, studies that have limiting assumptions, we should just study the intermittency in this natural laboratory that the solar wind provides. We also, uh, in this kind of last open question, want to understand exactly how the turbulence, how, how the dynamics uh, of, of the turbulent transport of energy uh, interacts with other kinds of processes. For instance, things like reconnection. There's been a, a plethora of recent models um, in which if, you're, if your current sheets become sufficiently thin, uh, they be, can, can become tearing mode and stable and actually reconnect, which makes your, your models much more complicated in terms of the kind of spectral indices that you'll expect to see. And so actually studying many of these dynamical processes are again something that we can do with a multi-point, multi-scale mission. 
Um, so where have we been before? Well, most of our observations and given the, the august uh, institution to which I'm talking about, I think all of this is, is fairly familiar, but we've been measuring the solar wind for 60 odd years now. We've sent spacecraft out there uh, basically since the, the Explorer days. Most of them have been focused on measurements that are relatively near the earth. Uh, this is a plot of a selected a uh, group of solar wind uh, observing missions. The x-axis is the log scale distance from the sun. Most things are sitting uh, effectively at the L1 point or in, in some sort of orbit around the earth. A lot of them have been pushing much, much further away from the sun, be it um, Voyager, be it New Horizons. Many of them uh, have been moving much, much closer to the sun. Uh, I can switch my hat and talk about the excitement that are, uh, associated with either Parker Solar Probe or Solar Orbiter. But almost all of these uh, on this list with the exception of um, actually MMS isn't on this list, it's on the next slide. Uh, almost all of these are single spacecraft missions, which means that as you move through that bath of turbulent fluctuations, you're only measuring along this single red line, which means that you're actually fundamentally getting a time series. And you have to make some assumptions about how to map that frequency series into a spatial series in order to compare against the predictions for how turbulence should be uh, structured as a function of space. And so that's a fundamental limitation if you want to study this multi-scale process. So this is the point that we have to step back and say, wait a minute, I, I know there have been some multi-point uh, missions. Haven't those been sufficient to address all of these questions. Well, missions like Cluster and like MMS have been previously launched uh, in, and, and most of their time has been spent in, um, in different configurations that have been optimized to study uh, processes that occur on a single scale. So for instance, uh, uh, optimized to spend their time basically sitting on the vertices of the tetrahedra. That enables them to do great uh, specific studies focused on a single spatial scale at a time. So for instance, MMS would spend some time with its uh, inner spacecraft separations on order of tens of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers, which means that it would be able to study the physics that's happening near one of these red lines at a particular point in time. What we're pr proposing to do with Heliosworm is not be at a single one of these red lines, but to actually cover an entire broad set of scales simultaneously. So effectively this entire range of, of blue scales at the same time, which will enable us to study the transport of energy from MHD to ion and through ion scales by having uh, spacecraft separations that are not focused on a single scale, but cover a broad set of scales. So what scales are the ones that we're going to be focused on for this, this mission concept? Well, it's the, the, the end of the MHD regime, the transition, and then into and through the ion kinetic scales. So we have, as I've said, been measuring the solar wind for uh, decades now. And because of that, we know what these physical scales are. We know that the transition from the MHD into the transition regime happens at our th around 1,000 to 1,200 kilometers. So, so this is a statistical quantity, so there is some uh, mean and variance around these values. We know that both uh, the ion gyro scale and the ion, I should say, proton inertial scale are around 100 kilometers. And so we want to be able to simultaneously capture uh, measurements of, of structures that are both in the 1,000, 3,000 kilometer range, and then uh, structures that are much smaller than that, so 100 down to even 50 uh, kilometers, and do both of those measurements at the same time. This also leverages a requirement on how quickly we need to measure and for how long in the interval we need to measure. Basically, uh, we want to be able to capture an ion scale structure that's blowing past us 
Uh, so we want to make sure that there is a current sheet that we're able to measure it several times as it moves past the configuration, which gives us how quickly these instruments need to actually measure. So they need to measure at faster than, than, uh, than basically a tenth of a hertz. But we also need the configuration to be stable on the order of about uh, an hour or so. And, and we know that because that's the, the kind of decorrelation time that we see in the solar wind. So we need the, the spacecraft not to be continually whizzing around over that period of time, but to be relatively stable over that period of time so that we can use the same uh, analysis technique and effectively have a stable observatory over that period of time. And that's where we have the, the mission concept that we've been, been designing over this last now uh, years, where we're proposing to launch not one, not four, but an entire observatory of, of nine spacecraft, a single hub, which, uh, a single hub which will have not, uh, eight nodes around it. And the, um, the spacing between the hub and the nodes will be structured in such a way that the inter-spacecraft baselines will simultaneously have separations that are both very small, smaller than 100 kilometers so that we can capture those sub-ion physics, but also simultaneously larger and into the MHD regime where we have separations on order of a thousand up to 3000 kilometers. And that will enable us to actually measure the cascade of structures from the MHD to uh, and through the ion kinetic scales, which will help us bring closure to some of those open questions that I, I cited at the beginning of, of this talk. Um, so <clears throat> specifically, uh, we have a set of, of two goals which are broken apart into specific objectives. The first goal is to use the solar wind to reveal the three-dimensional spatial structure and dynamics of turbulence and weakly collisional plasmas. And then the second goal is to understand exactly how turbulence interacts with different kinds of large-scale structures and different kinds of boundaries, things like the, the foreshock associated with the magnetosphere, as well as turbulence within the magnetosheath and the magnetosphere itself. So the specific objectives inside of those goals are to understand exactly how energy is transported from scale to scale to scale, to understand how that nonlinear coupling varies when you're in very extreme plasma conditions, say you're in a, a thermally dominated high beta environment or a, uh, a, a, a set of turbulence where you have what we call, say, high cross helicity. So you uh, have a lot of energy moving in one direction along the field versus the other and how that differs from a, a patch of turbulent fluctuations where you have an approximately equal amount of energy flowing in both directions. We want to be able to actually quantify how energy moves between the fields, the flows, and the protons themselves, and understand the impact of those current sheets on all of these different processes. So actually understanding how those, those intermittent structures uh, impact the, the observed proton distribution. So those are the specific goals and objectives that we're going to try to bring closure to. Uh, how are we going to do that? Well, um, uh, when I began this project, I naively thought, let's just stick everything at L1. That's what WIND has done. That's what ACE has done. That's going to work quite well. But instead, we, we, we were going with uh, a, a different set of orbits that will actually enable us to measure not just the pristine solar wind, but other near-Earth environments. And that's going to be by uh, using something known as a P over two lunar resonant orbit. So, so this is uh, laid out right here in which we're effectively moving through near Earth, the near Earth solar wind. And we'll be looping around the um, apogee and perigee are at about, um, let me get this right, 15 and 60 Earth radii, uh, and it's about a, a two week orbit. So when we're relatively close to the Earth, we're going to have opportunities for, uh, for, for actually downloading the data and downlinking that. And when we're relatively far out, the configurations will very slowly evolve to, uh, to be in the, in the geometric configurations we need for the kinds of analysis approaches 
uh, that, that we need to perform. But importantly, because the orbits of the, the hub and the, the uh, nodes are fixed in inertial space, as we go from season to season to season, as the Earth actually travels around the sun, we'll have the opportunity to measure in the different regions of near-Earth plasmas in order to study not just the pristine solar wind, but also these strongly driven plasmas, whether it's associated with foreshock, uh, with waves being driven by uh, along the, the connected magnetic fields, or actually studying what's happening, happening in the bow shock, the magneto sheath, and the magnetosphere itself. Um, and so, uh, so basically, as we process through the seasons, the orbit will naturally take us into all of these different environments. Uh, and the orbit has been specifically designed to provide good, what we're referring to as polyhedral and three-dimensional configurations in all of these different environments. So let's go ahead and actually define what those two different kinds of configurations are. Um, the first one, the polyhedral configuration, describes basically the geometric shape of any uh, uh, polyhedra uh, with respect to how elongated uh, and how flat that particular shape is. So if you imagine a tetrahedra, the ideal one would be basically sitting on a sphere with all the inner spacecraft separations having exactly the same separation. However, the world is not a world of platonic shapes. Uh, in reality, one of those spacecraft is going to be slightly closer. You're not going to be sitting at an elongation and planarity of exactly zero, but you'll be maybe a little more pancake-like. Maybe you'll be a, a little more sausage-like, depending on the exact configuration. But as long as you're somewhat pseudospherical, a lot of the analysis approaches that we're going to be employing that study uh, the the, the gradients uh, in the spatial structure will still be uh, able to be employed with, with a great deal of accuracy. So as long as we're kind of in this regular region where the planarity and the elongation are sufficiently low, we can study in great detail the gradients in the fields and flows uh, at the scale at which the, the spacecraft are separated. So if we have nine spacecraft, that gives us 128 different tetrahedra. And so the observatory has been designed such that we have uh, simultaneously tetrahedra that are pseudospherical, that are regular, that have relatively small separations and relatively large separations simultaneously. So that will let us be able to study the gradients, uh, the structure, both small and large scales uh, simultaneously. So that's what we refer to as these polyhedral configurations. Also, a lot of studies of turbulence look at uh, increments, look at changes uh, between two different spatial points. Uh, if you have nine spacecraft, that gives you 36 different vector baselines between those nine spacecraft. Uh, which means that we want to make sure that all of those different separations uh, are not all constrained to just being at one scale at any one po point in time, but instead have components that are at very large scales in that MHD regime, at very small scales in that ion uh, regime, and are also at, at scales in between. And so when we have a good three-dimensional configuration, the observatory uh, is designed such that um, we have components of those 36 baselines, both larger uh, than 1,200 kilometers, smaller than 100 kilometers, and at points in between. So this highlights one of those cases where we've broken the vector components into their RT and the vector baselines into their RT and N components and demonstrate that with those 36 baselines, we indeed have very large separations, very small separations. For a, a simple comparison, a single tetrahedra uh, only has um, six different baselines. Uh, and for one that has about a similar typical separation, it's only able to access one of these um, 
uh, one of these spaces at a time. In this particular case, it's sensitive to those transition scales, but it isn't sensitive to either the MHD range or the kinetic range at that particular point in time. And so that's what we gain by having nine spacecraft rather than just having four or even five. So I've talked very abstractly about these points moving around on a screen. We need to do some actual measurements. And so what instruments are actually going to be used to make these measurements to give us a better understanding of the underlying plasma? Well, on each of the nine spacecraft, we're going to have two different magnetometers, both a flux gate and a search coil. Their uh, frequency ranges are going to be designed so that we can go all the way from, from uh, low, DC, low frequency DC uh, all the way through the, those advected time scales, so faster than tenths of a second, so that we can fully capture the, those, those frequencies uh, that, that are needed in order to study the transition from the MHD to the ion kinetic scales. In addition to measuring those magnetic fields, we also need to get a measurement of the, uh, of the proton distributions themselves, and specifically the proton densities and velocities, so that we can understand um, things like a, a transport of, of energy using uh, things like El Sasser fields, which I realize I'll introduce in a slide or two. And so on each of the nine spacecraft, uh, we're, going to have, um, we're going to have a Faraday cup, which will enable us again to make these remarkably fast measurements of the local proton conditions. On the hub uh, and the hub alone, we're also going to have an ion electrostatic uh, analyzer, which will give us a very detailed measurement of the full distribution function, which will both give us a contextual understanding of what's happening hour to hour of the kinds of temperatures and, and, and um, say alpha abundances that will be useful for discriminating one kind of turbulence from another, but it'll also give us a detailed picture of the local velocity distribution function so that we can understand the impact of the kinds of turbulence we're seeing on the, uh, on the actual proton velocity distribution and especially understand how it departs from a simple Maxwellian picture. So those are the instruments that were actually going to be carried on the nine spacecraft. Um, I have yep, uh, some, some time to talk about the actual analysis approaches that, are, that we're going to be applying. So these are all analysis approaches that have been used previously for MMS and for cluster to, to basically study different aspects of the, of the transport uh, and dissipation of energy. What is going to be novel about Helioswarm is that we're going to be applying them not to four spacecraft, but to nine spacecraft simultaneously, and therefore able to understand how energy is transported from scale to scale. So in the, in the words of the concept study report, all of these analysis approach, approaches have high heritage. They've already been applied to previous missions. We're just going to apply them to a vastly expanded data set. So to demonstrate just how that will happen, we've uh, the science team has been doing uh, a lot of numerical modeling of different kinds of turbulence, getting your favorite box of, of numerical turbulence all shook up, uh, and then flying a version of the, uh, the Helioswarm Observatory through it, producing a set of nine different time series, and then applying these different kinds of analysis approaches to, uh, to those, those extracted, those synthetic time series. So this is a plot, I believe, of the Pegasus++ um, hybrid uh, PIC code uh, run by Lev Aramovsky Arimov over at Princeton. Uh, but we've also been using the, the Jekyll simulation and, and a few other MHD and RMHD simulations to do this kind of analysis. Um, just to demonstrate uh, the, the kinds of methods we've been looking at, one of them is something like a structure function, basically a way that we can study the intermittency, so just how intense and how frequent those different kinds of current sheets can arise. 
uh, studies that use only a single time series, whether it be ACE, whether it be Wind, whether it be Parker, um, all have to make this fundamental assumption where they measure a time series and they say, well, I want to, I want to um, look at the actual spatial structure. And so they say, given a, a measurement of the solar wind speed, they can make a correspondence between a spatial scale and a time scale. And based on that statistical argument, look at this increment, basically uh, the difference between the fluctuation at one time and at a time tau later, bring that to some power n, uh, and then take an ensemble average of that. Helioswarm won't be limited to that single time series, but rather we'll be able to look at the actual increment between any two points within the observatory, both as a uh, separated as a function of space and time. And in doing so, <clears throat> we'll be able to produce orders of magnitude more of these increments, which will increase the, the order to which one will be able to calculate these, uh, these structure functions. And so from those numerical simulations, we've constructed uh, this calculation of the, this structure function, not just at, at a single scale, but across the MHD transition and ion kinetic scales for uh, structure functions of order n uh, one through six. We actually have enough points that we can, can reasonably do that, uh, which can become quite a lift because uh, um, effectively to get a good statistically robust measurement of structure functions of order n, you need to have a uh, log of the number of points you're taking minus one uh, in order to get um, that many. Uh, so if you need to go to order six, um, you need basically 10 to the seven points uh, uh, increments calculated in order to get a good statistically robust uh, measurement there. So this will enable us to differentiate between different uh, predictions for how intermittency should behave. I've listed three of them on this plot, uh, ranging from your simplest uh, Komogorov-like uh, scaling to one proposed uh, by uh, Chandran, Shekhar Chicken, and Mallet back uh, now half a decade ago. And so hopefully being able to distinguish between these different kinds of, of, um, of models for intermittency using the measurements that Swarm will make. Um, we can also do similar kinds of calculations from cascade rates. Again, uh, if you go back to models from uh, Apolitano and Pauquet, uh, which basically took the models for hydrodynamic cascade rates and uh, recast it in terms of magnetohydrodynamics, the cascade rate is basically a, uh, a, a spatial gradient of a third order product. And one has, and, and many of the, the people uh, in the audience that I'm talking to right now have done these kinds of calculations with these single point observations. But what Helioswarm will enable is the ability to actually perform th those kinds of cascade rate calculations uh, across a larger number of increments and do it simultaneously across uh, both transverse to and along the mean magnetic field. And in doing so, enable the capture uh, of anisotropic cascade rates, uh, which can be compared to different models for how quickly the turbulence is, is moving the energy from scale to scale to scale. We can look at things like the decorrelation independently as a function of both time and space. Again, with a single spacecraft, you're sampling along a particular slice in time and space. But with an entire observatory, you'll be able to uh, separately measure how the turbulent fluctuations decorrelate with distance and with time, which are fundamental uh, predictions for, for, uh, for a turbulence model. Um, and so that's something that we simply can't access with a single spacecraft, but will be able to with a, a mission concept like Helios form. We'll be able to apply things like kilometer and be able to get accurate measurements of current at many scales simultaneously, and also be able to uh, robustly uh, reconstruct the magnetic field <clears throat> by doing those same kinds of, of uh, kilometer type 
uh, uh, methods, basically, where, where you're saying we're measuring at a certain number of points. We can therefore reconstruct the magnetic field. And then by leveraging the fact that we have 126 different tetrahedra, um, we can uh, average those estimates together to actually get a very high fidelity reproduction of the magnetic field uh, at both ion scales and MHD scales simultaneously. So those are the kinds of analysis techniques that we'll be able to, to actually perform. Um, but I'm going to, to zoom through that to just hit a few points about the mission design. And, and for this, I want to acknowledge and thank the flight dynamics team led uh, by, by Laura Pleiss at Ames, uh, uh, NASA Ames. Um, because she's done an excellent job in both actually designing where these spacecraft will go, but also helping us understand the process that this is not just we're a hockey team that's all trying to fly to one place, but rather uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we're continually moving in orbit. So much better analogy is that, you know, we're, we're a set of, of speed skaters continually moving around the rink. And so if you want to have certain configurations that are necessary for bringing closure to these, uh, these open questions about turbulence, um, you need to consider those orbital, orbital dynamics. Effectively, the, the simplest way for, for me at least to think about it is if you have two people that on a straightaway are moving at the same speed, um, as they turn around the corner, all of a sudden that person on the outside track is going to fall behind, which mean, means if you want them to be traveling the same distance, over a single orbit, they need to do some sort of lane crossover at some point uh, in that orbit. And so uh, you can't just have the entire uh, system fly in a simple formation, right? If you have this formation of four spacecraft in a perfect tetrahedra flying along, well, if they're doing some sort of circular orbit around the Earth, very quickly, the ones on the inside track are going to start gaining, the ones on the outside track are going to start losing, uh, and your formation is going to completely fall apart. So if you want to maintain a, um, if you want to maintain certain configurations, you have to uh, do some some very um, uh, careful consideration of those those flight dynamics, and so that's exactly what the the flight dynamics team has been doing. Basically, carefully designing um, using the uh, using their their understanding of exactly how the the orbits will go, uh, uh, designing into the uh, the trajectories uh, natural crossovers that enable the kinds of configurations we need to see, uh, the, the kind of relative uh, positions we need to see that occur for a sufficient number of hours for us to bring closure to the, the underlying uh, science. So uh, that leads to this particular kind of configuration that, that we have. Basically, when we're relatively close to the Earth is the time we're going to be downlinking the data. Uh, it's the time we're going to be doing very low thrust occasional maneuvers. That's another thing that I want to bring up here. We're not continually firing the thrusters to keep all the spacecraft in place. There's just a, uh, a single or a few maneuvers per orbit. And then the rest of the time that the uh, everything is is in free orbital flight, which means that we don't have to worry about those thrusters corrupting the science data. Um, and so that gives us these long interrupted periods of, of, uh, of time to actually collect those science data uh, near apogee. So we have about 10 days in the science part and about four days in the mission ops per 14 day cycle. So I know we're running short on time, uh, but I just wanted to help bring the side, the, the, the sense of scale here. Um, the, the largest separations that we have are about the same as the distance almost from UNH to Arizona. Uh, we, we can't quite get all the way to Arizona, but we can at least definitely get out to, uh, to Colorado. Uh, and so those are the, the, the kind of thousands of kilometers of separations uh, that we have between spacecraft. And they give us these wonderful kinds of movies that look like this, where effectively the hub is the center of this. And then we can watch 
the different nodes um, slowly orbit around, um, slowly orbit around the node. And as a function of the place in the orbit, uh, either have that polyhedral or that three-dimensional configuration that we see uh, that, that, that's required for the science. Now, this is, hopefully this will still load in time. Um, so yes, so again, uh, the, these are, are, are some of those movies where we see those baselines that are actually evolving very slowly as a function of time, but we see that they are both at very, very large scales and very small scales simultaneously. And so that's what brings us to this final, hopefully final slide as my internet slowly dies on me, um, where over the 12 month science phase, uh, we're able to get hundreds of hours in both of these good configurations and thousands of hours just generally measuring the solar wind, the foreshock and the, the, the magnetosphere, magnetosheath and, and bow shock. And in doing so, we'll help to transform our understanding of this ubiquitous process uh, that's important for, for transporting energy both here in the heliosphere, but also uh, through, throughout the universe. Um, we have a, a number of white papers that have been thrown up on, on archive uh, that, are, that I can point you to. Uh, if you have other questions, uh, reach out to me, reach out to Harlan, uh, and we'd love to, to fill you in on, on more details about this, uh, this exciting mission concept. So thank you for that. Uh, and I hope to have left enough time for a few questions. So thank you, Chris, for your talk. And um, does anyone have questions? Oh, um, there's Ben Chandran. I was just clapping. <laughs> nice oh, talk, just clapping. Oh, okay. <laughs> a lot of this, a lot of this, and I will pass to the next person. I think Jimmy has a question. Yeah, I got a couple of questions. Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, Chris, it was an excellent talk. I, mean, I learned a lot. Uh, second, I'm really excited. This seems to be a real good magnetosphere mission, too. <laughs> um, now about the orbits, I mean, you, you went into some detail there and, but still, I mean, you're, you're basically playing with the Lagrangian point there. I mean, where the, state, the orbits are pretty much not very stable. Um, so eventually your spacecraft will start drifting apart. I mean, so how much fuel do you have? How long can you keep them actually in that configuration? Because eventually the fuel will run out. So we are designing for a 12 month uh, science uh, phase, which will get us through each of the seasons to sample each of these different regions. Um, so it's, it's not going to sit at L1 in the same way that wind has for the last 20 years. Uh, I don't know if we have specific numbers on how much fuel reserve we'll, we'll have to kind of keep things in, in station keeping, but I will note that the, the design that has been put, uh, that has been constructed here uses actually relatively low thrust and is not constantly driven, but just has a, a single or a few uh, thrusts applied uh, each orbit. It looks like we may have a chat comment that, um, there we go. Um, so Laura Pleiss, who's the one who actually did, did the, the, the design here. Um, okay, uh, three years. Notes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because after that, the spacecraft will, of course, I mean, I understand you don't have to push them all the time. You just have to yep. nudge them a little bit and you do that through perigee, you know, and on all that. But eventually you'll run out of fuel, you know, and then you'll have to, then they will start drifting apart, you know. Uh, the other thing I, I think, I, I'm not sure this is really clear, but I mean, you, you process around the earth with the moon, so, I mean, talking about seasons is, is maybe a little confusing because within one year, I mean, you process around 12 times, right? Or, or do I misunderstand that? No, we, we only go around once um, per year. Let's go back to that. Here, right. So the orbit of the hub is fixed in inertial space. And so it, it 
proceeds around once every 14 days, but then as the earth goes around the sun, there's that slow procession. Yeah, yeah, that's the yearly procession. But if you are not, I mean, but you also said you're locked in with the orbit of the moon. So that means you're actually going around the earth, I mean, once, once a month. And you have to, because otherwise your spacecraft will become, will coming very close to the moon. I mean, and then they will be just shot out of the, into space, you know, I mean, I mean, you seem to be locked into the orbit of the moon. So it uses a lunar resonant orbit. Um, yeah. And I think it's, it's a P over two because it's not a 28 day orbit rather, but rather a 14 day orbit. Um, if I'm, I'm going to actually defer to Laura if, if she'd like to speak up here or provide insight via the chat. Um, I think I'm off. Can you hear me? I don't know how many mute yes, buttons I have to push. Hear you. Yes, um, I'm so fascinated, Chris, that you gave this magnificent talk on all these science things and your questions are about the orbit. Um, yes, the lunar resonant orbit is exactly timed to have its period to be half the period of the moon so that when the, it's in line with the moon, it's far away by being close to perigee. And so that's where the orbital period comes from. And then the placement, if you just think about the placement of the apogee, um, that is the inertial element that tra traverses the three regions once per year. Okay. At the, the bottom tip there of the red oval on Chris's, di Chris's diagram. Okay, I have to think about that, how <laughs> oh, that works. But, uh, 